in northeast Lancashire on the old northern route between Lancashire and Yorkshire, there is the market town of Clitheroe. It is a pleasantly picturesque town and is the second oldest borough in Lancashire, its charter having been granted in the year 1147. Even early in the 19th century, Clitheroe was described as a small industrial town, and this description is still true today, and several well-known firms have factories in and around the town. Clitheroe has a long history, and the most striking reminder of its past is the castle, which occupies a commanding position in the centre of the town. A climb up to the castle is rewarded by a fine panoramic view of the town and its surroundings. In the distance, the hills give promise of pleasant countryside, whilst in the foreground, the rows of terraced houses are typical of Lancashire industrial towns. By the side of the railway, there is Clitheroe Gasworks, with the gas holder standing up like some kind of modern castle keep. The gasworks may not add to the beauty of the scene, but its story does form a part of the history of the town. So it is interesting to take a look at the plant as it was in 1968 while still making gas. Clitheroe gasworks are more than usually a part of the town because there is a public right of way clean through the site. The office building was erected in 1880 and stood four square in the middle of the works. Inside the office, a deed box was preserved containing a wealth of old documents dating back to the inception of the Clitheroe Gas Light Company over 140 years ago. Most of these old papers are not official records, but are the rough notes taken at the early meetings. They are on odd pieces of paper, some are in ink and some in pencil, and some have 140-year-old doodles on them. One is scribbled on the back of what in those days served as an envelope, merely a folded piece of paper secured with sealing wax. This was before the adhesive postage stamp, and this letter is postmarked Bolton, 1837, but Hornby. The earliest document records a meeting of some townspeople of Clitheroe at the Rose and Crown Hotel, now the Starkey Arms on Thursday evening, 7th of April, 1836, for considering the practicability of establishing a gas company for the town of Clitheroe. Only seven weeks later, a second meeting at the Rosen Crown agreed that a gas company should be formed and that the prospectus now presented should be adopted and printed forthwith. The prospectus stated that it was a matter of regret that up to then the inhabitants of Clitheroe had not had works for lighting the streets with gas and introducing that pleasant and economical light into shops and houses. Uh, nor had they been able to avail themselves of that valuable discovery of modern science. So at the grammar school room on May 31st, 1836, the board of the new gas company held its first meeting. Those present being the chairman the Reverend Walter Posthumus Powell, Doctor of Civil Laws of Well Hall. He was headmaster of the grammar school and the first incumbent of St. James's Church, Clitheroe. John Aspinall of Standon Hall, still the home of the Aspinall family. Leonard Baldwin, a solicitor of Clitheroe, and thanks are due to the Baldwin family, past and present, for the preservation of these interesting old records. Jeremiah Garnett of Waddle Hall, James Thompson, a cordwainer, a boot, shoe and clog maker, Walter Cockshot, an ironmonger and iron founder, Robert Hornby, a builder and timber merchant, James Garstang, a surgeon of Clitheroe, John Howarth, brewer of Shawbridge Brewery, William Miller, an engineer, Charles Radcliffe, a grocer, who served for 25 years. William Sibbald, the first treasurer and probably a bank manager. Robert Trapps, solicitor, and William Lister Oddy, also a solicitor and secretary of the company.
The committee set to work energetically, and within eight days, the purchase of the present gasworks site was approved at Farthing per Yard. On July 29th, the offer of Mr. Scott of Stockport to complete the gas apparatus at £25 was accepted. The committee also authorised an account for bricklayers' lodgings at a sum not exceeding two shillings per week each. The deed of establishment of the company dates from the 16th of September 1836 and it states that the intent, purpose and object of the company is the lighting of the houses, manufactories, shops, buildings, streets and public places in Clitheroe. Now the company was concerned with an agreement with the corporation for lighting the streets and with the laying of mains and erection of street lamps. The names of the streets concerned are still familiar. Castle Street, Moor Lane, Parsons Lane, Lower Gate and Wellgate. In Market Place, a special large lamp was erected, which was cast by Walter Cockshot at 15 shillings per tonne. In 1968, there was still a large lamp in Waterloo Road, which bore the inscription, Walter Cockshot, Iron Founder, Clitheroe. Another plate recorded that it was erected by public subscription in 1837, so it must surely be the original large lamp. Now it is relegated to the edge of a car park, but without its handsome hexagonal lantern. So, by February 1837, all was ready at the gas works. The gas supply to the town was turned on and the lamps were lighted, less than 11 months after the first town's meeting at the Rose and Crown. At the first annual general meeting in May 1838, a dividend of 5% was declared. So the Clitheroe Gaslight Company was now fully established. Two years later, an auction sale included as Lot 8 all those two shares in the Clitheroe Gaslight Company, the works of which company are in a very prosperous and flourishing condition. A gas rate of sixpence in the pound was levied to pay for the cost of street lighting, but collection of the rate proved difficult, and non-payment led to goods being seized and sold by auction at the corner of the Red Lion Inn. The company continued to prosper, and in 1877 it was bought by the corporation. Then, in 1949, it was vested in the Northwestern Gas Board, but gas was produced continuously on the original site at Back Commons from 1837 until 1968. That first works was of a primitive type, and over the years the process was improved and mechanized. But basically, the carbonization process remained the same. And at least, Clitheroe was one of the few works still using horizontal retorts. And we now see the works in action only a few days before final closure. The process started with the arrival of coal, and these are the last few wagons to be unloaded at the works. After the wagon has been shunted into position on the edge of the receiving hopper, lifting gear is used to raise one end so that the coal can run from the wagon into the hopper. From the hopper, the coal passes to an elevator, which carries it up to bunkers high in the retort house. The retorts were about 20 feet long by 2 feet wide, built of fire brick and heated externally. 
and there were mouthpiece doors at each end. The retort benches comprised a number of retorts, each with its own mouthpiece doors and an offtake pipe to convey the gas to the next stage in the process. The carbonizing period was 12 hours, and during this time all was quiet in the retort house, with shafts of sunlight through the ventilation openings making pleasant patterns. At the end of this peaceful interlude, power is switched on, and the combined discharging and charging machine is brought into position. A retort door is opened and the residual gas escapes and ignites in a burst of flame. At a signal from the other side of the retort bench, the discharger is operated and a ram unwinds from the machine and passes into the retort pushing out the red-hot coke. The coke falls into a travelling skip, positioned to receive it at the opposite end of the retort. The retort is now ready for recharging, and the same machine takes a supply of coal from the overhead bunker. The coal drops onto rapidly revolving paddles, which throw the coal into the retort and gradually slow down, so that the coal falls progressively nearer to the charging end. When the retort is fully charged, the door is closed and the retort is ready for another 12-hour carbonizing period, and the machine moves on to the next retort. Some coke is fed straight from the retort to the producer furnace for heating the retort setting. In the horizontal retort process, the coke discharged from the retorts is still red hot, and in this state it would, of course, soon burn away in air. Therefore, it must be quenched and cooled. So the skip of hot coke moves away to the quenching gantry outside the house. The coke skip is positioned under water sprays which are then turned on so that the coke is quenched and cooled. When quenching is complete, the coke is carried away to the stock pile. From the stockpile, the coke is fed to an underground hopper, from which it is lifted by an elevator to the coke screens. The screens grade the coke into various sizes, and it then drops into hoppers, from which it is loaded for sale into sacks, lorries or railway wagons. Meanwhile, the hot gas passes from the retort house to the condensers, 
where it is cooled and most of the tar is removed. Then to the exhausters, which draw the gas from the retorts and pump it on through the rest of the plant. Next to the rotary scrubber, the static washer and the electrostatic detarer, where ammonia, naphthalene and the last traces of tar are removed. The purifiers are the final stage in the treatment process. These contain layers of iron oxide through which the gas flows for the removal of sulphur. Lastly, the gas passes into the gas holder and is ready for the consumers. After 130 years of life, gas manufacture at Clitheroe ceased in April 1968 because the coal carbonisation era was ending and more modern methods at larger, more distant plants took over to meet the increasing